How are you guys doing? Hey, yesterday was the first day I've actually not uploaded since this, this entire conflict started. I know we've uploaded every single day. I was actually with my daughter all day, and I had to take her down to a birthday party, so I was a little bit tied up, so my apologies. But I will say, I do have a little bit of a, a banger for you guys. It's a, it's a banger for you guys today. So if you guys are new, map has changed just a tad bit down here in the eastern side of the country. This is going to be the focal point of this war from here on out uh, until something changes. So red, Russia, blue, Ukraine. So if you guys are new to the channel, yes, this is my map. It is updated every single day. If you're new, do yourself a favor and subscribe because I generally do not miss uploads. Yesterday was the first time in two months we've actually missed one. It wasn't on purpose. I spent the day with my daughter. So if you're ever wondering if the normal Russian citizen was ever supporting the war in Ukraine or if they supported the troops, well, here is a video coming out of Kirk's region. This is actually the, the civilians are still doing a, a sending off or seeing off of their soldiers inside of this area. And even more ironic, this next clip is actually coming from a pro-Russian rally being held in Germany. Yes, Germany of all places, these people live in a free society and have access to free thinking media. They can actually see stuff on the internet. And this, this, this video, hey, just go ahead and play that one. So the ironic thing about this, I know this is going to sound... Crazy. This is ironic. The fact that the people in Germany are claiming the Russians are freeing the Ukrainians from the Nazis. Yes, that's what they believe, that Russia is freeing Ukraine from Nazis. The people in, it's just, I don't know, weird, very strange times. And this is another video coming out of Shanghai. Once again, this is, we showed this the other day, and they remember them screaming, doing their little, little bit and piece there. But the unrest has gotten so bad due to the lockdowns. I think they're on day like four now of another Shanghai deal. Apparently, there's food shortage and causing civilians to go a little stir crazy, apparently. So, here is that. So the Russian ambassador to the United States has recently said that Western shipments of arms to Ukraine, which are being used against Russian forces, are beginning to reach a breaking point in which a direct conflict with U.S. NATO in Russia is very likely. I don't see that being the case. I don't know this for a fact, but I believe Russia knows they would lose that conflict, that war. I There's just there's no way. Maybe I'm just ignorant because I am an American living in America. But I, I think the rest of the world pretty much knows this, and I think Russia should know this, that they wouldn't win a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle with anybody, or NATO, or America, in fact. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a thing. China's also apparently moving arms to the allies of Russia. They're moving them to Serbia. They flew over two NATO countries, by the way, to do so. Western concerns that an arm buildup in the Balkans during the war in Ukraine can threaten peace in the region. I don't really know why that has to be said out loud but apparently they had to. They delivered 18 of these anti-aircraft systems you guys are currently seeing over the last 48 hours. So yes, China is somewhat helping them, not somewhat is. So we know they're currently on the same side there. So Finland and Sweden, we talked about them a few separate times over the last week. They are now both to set to join NATO as soon as this summer. I saw soon Sweden would be after Finland, but I think Finland was going to join in June is what they're, it's what it's looking like. So this is somewhat ironic due to the fact that Putin's main goal of this entire war was to stop the expansion of NATO East. But guess what? His invasion now has done nothing but invigorated and unified NATO allies and ended up expanding to his borders. So it is somewhat ironic. And I, I actually, I, I'm kind of glad about this because, of course, I'm going to be on NATO's side here. But Sweden and Finland are fairly strong militaries. You know, Sweden's got some money. Finland's got a pretty good military. I mean, they, they did defeat the Russians, I think it was in 39 or 38 when they tried to take over there. I think what we talked about this the other day, there was 200,000 of them. The Finnish general said, said you can you could bring your men and your 200, you could join the 200,000 of you guys who are already here. So, all right. So over in Kiev, another mass grave has actually been discovered. 50 civilians have been found to have been shot by Russian troops on the road leading into the village of Buz Buzovaya. Within the village itself, they've also found another mass grave with dozens of bodies inside of it. So there's another indication that the same stuff has been going on. And I told you guys I thought this stuff would continue to go out. Who knows what's going on inside the areas? 
that they've been controlling since the very beginning. And also, apparently it's going to go inside this order. This is coming from the Chechnyan, the Chechnyan leader, the, the old my, mighty Chechnyan leader himself, has said that they're going to take Mariupol and complete the takeover of the eastern side of the country and then move north to secure Kiev. He said that that is going to be the goal and they're going to do it. I'm going to say right now, it's going to be a very difficult task. By that time, I'm sure they're going to have much more munitions in place and a little bit better strategy. I, I do believe the West is going to step in at some point. I, I, I will say, if we're going to look at this map real quick, this area, if you guys are new, down here on the eastern side of the country, which is right here, Slovenas, uh, Severnodesk, and, and pretty much this entire area, Pop Santa, pretty much this entire area you guys are seeing. I'm just going to draw this little square. We're going to see casualty rates as high as World War II over the next month or so. It, that's that's if this conflict goes on. We know that the Russian buildup right now is fairly massive right here, like fairly massive. They moved a lot of, of BTGs into this area, but a lot of these BTGs are actually, I, I'm not going to say that they're inoperable, but they're not fully manned because there are a lot of the ones that came out of Sumy, Chernihiv, and, and Kiev over the last uh, two weeks or so. They've been moving in, and we do know there's a lot there of a huge, massive buildup there. But Kharkiv has been shelled 66 times in the last 24 hours. 66 times. If you guys don't know Kharkiv is at, so this is going to be the main area that we're going to be talking about, by the way, is going to be the eastern side of the country because that's pretty much where everything is. That's actually where everything is going on as right now. So Kharkiv was shelled 66 times in the last 24 hours. 11 people were killed, including children, and 14 more were injured. Kharkiv is one of the areas they haven't been able to take. And if we move just a little bit north, you guys have this town of Belt Gorod, which is right here. Now, this is a logistical hub and has been for the entire time. It's one of the areas the Russians utilize to rotate their soldiers in and out for rest and refit. So they do ro rotate them in and out of this area, and they have been since the beginning of the conflict. Now, there's a lot of main routes that come in out of here, a lot of supplies. Kupiansk is one of the areas, which we know is down on, let's see, here's Kupiansk right here. Matter of fact, Kupiansk is another logistical hub. You know, I'm going to go ahead and clean this map up because it kind of irritates me when it's like that. All right, they're nice and clean. So here's Kupiansk. This is a logistical hub. The same thing with Belograd, which is going to be just right here. So I'll keep those for you guys. Russian activity in the Kharkiv area has actually been pretty much the same thing over the past week. Soft units have been uh, attacking critical infrastructures to try and weaken Ukrainian defensive operations. So there's roughly five BTGs worth of men, Russians that is, on the outskirts of Kharkiv currently. They've actually mined this entire area, which I do have shown here. So you guys see this right here. This has now been added. So that area, they're now starting to lay mines. The same type of stuff that we saw uh, them doing on the eastern side of Kiev before they were actually overran. So this entire area is going to be a focal point. And they've been trying to, they've been doing little tiny probing ops, trying to find a weak point in the Ukrainian defenses to actually get in and actually continue that offensive south. They have not been able to push into Kharkiv, as we know. This whole entire area for the Russians has been pretty significantly difficult to maintain. They did take over the town of Chuhiv toward the beginning. They've done nothing but lose ground inside of this area. So right now there's five BTGs with the men surrounding Kharkiv. So like I told you guys, I use Belgorod as a logistical hub. So a lot of the men are moving in and out of there. And I will say, see this main route. I'm going to go ahead and just draw it real quick for you guys. All right. So really leads down. This is the one they're taking to get all the, the, the resupply down into Kupians and the other side of Izium. So the, the image you guys are currently seeing is a satellite image. It's coming out of this, this town of Velk, Velky Burlak right there. So it's just off that main route. And there's hundreds of vehicles inside of this image, including armored vehicles and artillery pieces moving southbound through this town. Now it's eight miles long. So it's another one of these really long convoys, and that's exactly where it's at. And you can already tell where it's going. So, I mean, I could I could take my little racer tool and show you guys. I mean, this is pretty, pretty, pretty evident. It's going to come down this main route and link up in Kupiansk. And I told you guys at the very beginning, when the eastern side of this country became the, the new focal point, that I believe that Kupiansk was going to be one of the logistical hubs. And I believe that this is one of the areas of Ukrainian, if they, if they need, that this is one of the areas they need to actually target if they're even able to. I don't think they can get that far back there as of right now. It's going to be the same thing as Ivankov was in the northeast, or excuse me, the northwest side of Kiev. That was their logistical hub. This is it right here. It also has a train station that goes through there. So they're able to get supplies in from Russia through on train. So this is also the third time Russian forces have hit the nitric acid tanks in Rubazine. I thought it was the same thing over and over again. Yes, this is the third time. This is nuts. So here's Rubazine right here. Heavy conflicts have been going on there since the very beginning. I actually have footage I'm going to show you guys of this right now.
Matter of fact, if you're wondering what it looks like in the town of Rubizon itself, which I have been actually, this is the first time I've seen some video footage on the Russian side, which is going to be the northern side, as you can see here on the map. They control the northern side of this area. Here is that for you guys right now. Hasn't been a, a lot of change when it comes to ground taken by either side. I will say the Russian forces have taken a little bit of area just on this, this eastern side. It's not really it's not really clear where I can actually change the map for you guys. When I'm talking like taking some ground, I'm talking like two houses deep worth of ground. They're not taking very much. It's very slow, but they have taken take, they have taken heavy casualties along with the Ukrainians. I do know this. I saw some figures this morning that were actually stating that Ukrainian forces have actually had almost eighteen thousand KIA, which I could believe. But it's also stating that now the Russian force is about to crack 20,000 KA. They're at like 19,500 as of today. I did indicate a little bit of areas on here. See these gray areas we had on the, the western side of the country earlier. These are key areas that need to be taken by the Russian forces if they're planning to take this side of the country. This area, this town right here, Apokvrix. See these main roads are coming in out of here? These are decisive points they need to take. This is one of these areas, this is one of these cities that has to be taken if they're going to push through. So we can sail right now in Donetsk. So they actually have a large buildup in these two areas. Horlikov, I struggle with some of these names. But we know that they have a massive truth buildup on this eastern side right here, on these three areas. Now this is a key decisive area for them to take, along with this area over here. And this is the northern side, southern side of Izium, I guess you would say. Barvinkov, this is another one. These are two crucial areas, decisive tactical points for the Russian military to take if they want to take this side of the country. Now, the southeast side of Izium. So the southeast side of Izium, which is right through here, we could, I can tell you guys right now, they have actually started to put an assaulting element in two separate areas. Russian forces have resumed offensive operations towards Slovenas, but haven't made much advancement due to heavy Ukrainian resistance on the route leading in. So I have told you guys, I think I told you guys this last week, they did try to push through here and hit heavy resistance. This main route that comes through here, right there you guys are seeing, they're going to have a lot of trouble getting through. They're mainly due to the fact if they were having trouble in the northeastern side of this country in Sumi with ambushes, this main route coming in is going to be very difficult. It is heavily, heavily fortified, and I have seen images inside of this area of civilians even refortifying some of these areas even more. We, this area, they've been in the conflict for the last eight years. This area is going to be really, really difficult for the Russian forces to take on the ground. So it also been noted that the airport inside of Nirpo has been totally destroyed by Russian missile attacks. I have seen some images of that. I don't know if it's totally destroyed, but I don't know if it's just inoperable. It could be repairable. I also want you guys to know that I've seen reports, this is even crazier, that Russians could possibly go for the Nirpo instead of trying to take the east. I have a really hard time believing that. Like a really difficult time believing that. I mean, mainly, let's just think about that for a second. They couldn't even take the northern side of this country. What would make anybody believe that they're going to veer off and move west like what in the world would make you think that when they couldn't even take this area as of right now they've been trying to take this area for the last eight years do you think that they're going to be able to do that right now if they try to do that i, I don't believe that's going to be the case but if they do they're going to be spreading themselves so extremely thin they're not going to be able to secure anything worth of any like on this eastern side and they're going to have to give it back like they did in the northern side of the country so just wanted to tell you guys we're going to move down here to Mariupol. There has been a little bit of troops in contact, ticks, going down here in Hulipol. They've been trying to, they've been doing probing attacks the Russians have been doing in these two areas of Volodahar and Hulipol. Here in Hulipol, though, has been uh, fairly, fairly a little bit more active than the rest of this area. They've mainly been focusing on Mariupol, but they've been trying to find a way in. And this goes back to Dnipro again. If they're trying to find a route to get all the way up into there, this would be a very good one to take. So let's just keep note of that. But over here in Hulipool, they've actually been under contact for the last 24 hours fairly heavily. All right, so we're going to move down here into Mariupool. So I have I have actually updated pretty significantly. They have actually broken up into three different areas. Them and the Russians have split them up, as you guys can tell right here. Uh, they've cut them off inside the city, so they actually did push through. And they did close the gap right here, as you guys can see, over the last 12 to 24 hours. That gap has now been closed. They are making very, very, very slow progress. That is the Russians. It's, it's literally like a house every day, like worth of, worth of area you take them. Now, the north and eastern side of this, this area is actually seeing the heaviest fighting. Currently, with both sides, are actually taking heavy, heavy losses. So up inside of this region right here is probably the, the, the most significant fighting has been going on. But as you guys can tell, I don't know how long they're going to be to hold off. Inside this area, is it going to be a week? Is it going to be a day? No one really actually knows. Civilian casualties have continued to mount inside the city as Russian forces have indiscriminately targeted the entire city. 
not just bits and pieces. They're just sending rounds in the entire the, the entire held areas that aren't uh, Russian controlled as of right now. I do, I do know down in this area, this is this is mostly going to be your Chechnyan areas. This right through here. So this is where the most of that. The, if you guys see those crazy fighting videos with the guys like sticking their weapons out the window and just shooting them randomly, or like jumping up shooting an RPG over their head, those are the those are the Chechnyan fighters. They, they're not really great at fighting. They're, they're more or less, they're just cannon fodder, and they just love doing this, so they just kind of go in and do their thing. They haven't really made too much ground uh, inside this area, but that's pretty much that. This is your situation down in Mariupol. As of right now, the elements down there, the Russian elements have split up the Ukrainian elements, and I have no idea how long they're actually going to be able to hold this thing off. And I give them props. They've held it off for almost 40 days or so now, legitimately. Actually, I think we're on like day 45 or something. So they've held it off for a first very significantly longer number. They, they could hold this thing off for two more weeks for all I know. I mean, four or five days ago, they were still shooting tanks inside of the city. So I, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Anyway, this is pretty much your situation. Not much has changed over to make a lives. So we're not going to really go over there. There has been some, some fighting in the same Southern region. They, no one really has any gained any ground though. So that's pretty much that Eastern side of the country is going to be the decisive point of this entire war right now. This whole area you're seeing right here. We'll, we'll know the next week, two weeks, Russian forces haven't pushed all down there. I do know that. I keep seeing them amp up and build up their, their forces. So hope you guys do have a great day. I will see you guys here later on in the... Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow, actually. Matter of fact, I do love you guys. I'm out.